And uh, for our audience, the rest of it uh, is uh, going to be an interesting remaining part of the day. So we're actually going to be changing things up. Uh, instead of uh, Cedric uh, presenting next, we're actually going to uh, keep you on your toes here. And we're going to actually run a pre-recorded video from Derek Gilling, the CEO at Mosif, who's doing uh, some really interesting thing with uh, things with API analytics um, and folding in security with that. So uh, without further ado, I'll go ahead and hand it over to our um, my stalwart uh, with Victor to go ahead and run that uh, that recording. Yeah, hi. Today we're going to be talking about different API security threats. What are some different ways for you to mitigate these new uh, upcoming threats with APIs? A little bit about myself. I'm the CEO of Mosif, the API analytics platform, and I love focusing on ABS strategy, security, and observability. I also love uh, IPAs. You can find me at the logo bar here in uh, San Francisco, like Zeitgeist. What's so interesting about APIs? Well, they're super powerful. They provide direct access to your data, and they usually also expose very large resource limits. Right. Um, many of your customers want to uh, process vast amounts of um, whether it's entities or items or contacts or something like that. But with great power comes great responsibility. So today I'm going to be walking through the top 10 things that we see coming about that you should be thinking about. <clears throat> the first thing that we see is insecure pagination. It's pretty common for an API to provide some way for you to access let's say 10 items, 50 items, or 100 items at a time, especially if you have like an e-commerce platform. Um, but with this, this also exposes uh, hackers um, where they can actually scrape this data and, for, and download your entire database. Even if you don't have any PII information, um, this allows them to run further analysis, which exposes you to things like rainbow tables and dictionary attacks. A naive way to prevent this is by adding uh, some type of limit or pagination, right? And then saying you can only fetch up to 100 items or only 10 items. So this can just make your API too chatty because a hacker can easily create a script that will continue to increment that counter, fetch the first 10 items, then the second 10 items, and so on. They could even add some random delays which can cir circumvent or bypass certain detectors out there. A way to identify this type of behavior is to tracking the number of items touched at a user level versus just, you know, per minute or per second and so on at the rate limit level. This way you can see, you know, and identify users who are within the norms, say on average your customers access, you know, a thousand items in a 24 hour period versus users who may be way above those norms. And this could be because of malicious behavior or they're just not using API in the right way. But either way, it makes sense for you to reach out and, and work with those customers in the right uh, manner to, for them to be successful. The second thing we see coming about is insecure API key generation. With this, we a lot of times see hackers trying to create large pools of API keys, <coughs> each uh, accessing your API from different IP addresses. This can help circumvent or bypass uh, detectors You know when you know, lots of IP addresses uh, for the same AB key and that type of stuff. One way to help uh, secure this is by uh, ensuring your API keys are generated in a secure fashion, right? Um, maybe before you create that master key uh, or that refresh token, uh, make sure you have a capture behind it or two-factor authentication. Use things like single sign-on or SAML. And then from there, you can, of course, allow your customers to generate short-lived tokens in an automatic way. But the first piece is uh, really important to be um, as secure as possible. Third thing we see coming about is uh, key exposure. Um, APIs are expected to be accessed uh, over a very large uh, or indefinite amount of time. Right? You have a long-running process. Many times a developer will you know, copy or paste that key into a, like a, a tool like Postman or curl command, right? They're, they're literally touching those tokens um, on a day-to-day -day basis. In addition, the only thing you need is to hold that bearer token. You don't require any other evidence to access your API. One way to uh, reduce this exposure is what's called having a refresh token and a short-lived token. And these two keys work in pairs so that um, when you are using that short-lived token, 
which might expire after maybe an hour or a couple hours, um, if it does get exposed by the time a hacker has access to it, it's already expired, right? And that long-lived token, what's called a refresh token, um, that's stored in a secure environment, and that's generating these short-lived tokens maybe through some type of uh, key store or service that developers don't see on a day-to-day -day basis. The fourth thing we see happening is exposure to DDoS or availability issues. If you look at a traditional website, you know, let's say you're using Facebook Messenger, it's pretty unlikely for a Facebook user to bring down the entire application just from some bad behavior. It could be even unintentional. With an API, you know, excessive polling and other things can easily bring down uh, your entire service or server. In addition, most of the traffic looks like bot traffic already. Right? It's one in the same. It's very hard to identify what is considered bot traffic that's scraping an API versus you know, a customer that's using your API within your typical terms of service. This limits using things like CAPTCHAs and other mechanisms. With an API, your rate limits is the API equivalent of a CAPTCHA. Um, what we recommend in this case is you know, fine-grained resolution, you know, making sure that you're able to uh, track and, and limit access or, or reject that request as needed. And that can be done at the resource level. For example, if a person is creating thousands of reviews, which is way beyond what you uh, expect from your customers, reject at that level. User level uh, rate limits, this can be done at the IP address or API key level. In addition, having different mechanisms for you to audit and deactivate users, you know, if they are abusing it before it affects anyone else's uh, availability or, or service level. Example in this case, you know, we're, we're creating a rule here or when a user creates more than a thousand reviews in a 24 hour period, we just reject that request with a 429 error saying too many requests, and also a quick message saying why the request is being rejected. Make your API developer friendly so you know what to do in this case. The fifth item we see is uh, just bad server hygiene. Right? Um, it's really important for you to ensure your SSL certificates are up to date, maybe an easy way for you to automatically, automatically generate those SSL certificates Another thing is blocking insecure traffic, right? Many times a customer might uh, inadvertently use port 80 or, or non-SSL uh, when accessing it from Postman or something like that. Um, and just adding things like uh, cross and sharing and error, error messages. Making sure your, your API is buttoned up just from a server hygiene perspective. This one's an interesting one, which is uh, incorrect cache headers. Um, you know, security and performance can be a trade-off. Right? By adding you know, caching and other layers, you're actually adding more complexity to your API. And this especially is, is scary when you start using custom or non-standard headers. For example, you might use something like x-api-key uh, and insert that API key into one of your request headers. Um, the problem there is that most proxy servers don't understand or, or can't uh, uh, do cache busting on those type of keys. Um, your customers may even cache, even if you don't do it yourself. You know, for example, you know, if they're exceeding rate limits, they might want to add some type of a proxy on their side. Well, they might be uh, using different applications, one for you know, sandbox environment, one for production environment, and you want to make sure they're not able to pollute that data across those different applications. So one thing we recommend is try to avoid cache headers as much as possible. But if you um, really, really need it, make sure you um, follow the standards for HTTP. So use stuff like the uh, authentication header and so on. Uh, also make sure you set the, the very header accordingly. So if you do have a custom header, uh, we recommend adding stuff like access API desk key in that very header, which allows cast busting to work in the correct way. The seventh thing uh, we see happening is uh, incorrect logging or monitoring. In fact, this is in the top 10 uh, OWASP uh, top 10 list. Uh, if you're only tracking things like uh, you know, exceptions or stack traces, you may be missing things like unauthorized errors. Um, this could be a, a malicious user from the same IP address trying to probe your API or trying to download a, a file. In fact, the time to, to detect a breach takes over 200 days. So if you only keep your logs around for seven days, how are you gonna go back you know, with your forensics team to see what's happening here? When it comes to logging and monitoring, we recommend tracking two different things. Number one, uh, what was accessed? Uh, what resources, you know, how was access? Was it a delete? Was it you know, a get? And also, who was accessing it? 
but what is the person's email, IP address, geolocation, any other information you're able to um, gather so you have both these uh, different data points. Number eight, this is uh, coming up more and more, especially as uh, APIs are depending on more third-party services. Uh, we already saw uh, the hack from SolarWinds. Now we saw the uh, Microsoft Sane server hack. In this case, uh, you're having your data sit in a variety of different services. Even if uh, you don't get hacked, uh, it's, it's possible that one of your vendors gets hacked. And things like encryption at rest don't really matter too much because it's unlikely that a hacker is going to physically have access to your, your storage media or your SSDs. One way to uh, help uh, prevent these type of hacks is leveraging zero knowledge security. Uh, more and more services are providing things like client-side encryption, customer managed keys, or, or also what's called bring your own key. That way, even if they do get hacked, you know, your, your data is not exposed, right? Um, they would also need to have access to those encryption keys, which hopefully is uh, held within your infrastructure versus their infrastructure. So then they need multiple different um, hack points uh, before that data can truly be used. Number nine is just not securing internal endpoints. You know, many times the application might have user impersonation, admin endpoints, things used by say support teams or cost success teams if these are left open or exposed to the public, then it's easy for um, you know, a hacker to use those, right? Impersonate any user. What we recommend in this case is any internal endpoint, even if it's within your internal network, it should be treated as if they're exposed to the public anyways, right? What I mean by that is make sure that you, you know, have monitoring and, and auditing in place for these internal endpoints. Uh, also, you know, leverage things like individual RBAC. Just like, you know, if you're providing uh, access to a Linux server, you're not going to share the same root password, you know, with every employee or every internal team member. Uh, have the ability to deactivate the account if needed. And same thing as I mentioned before, make sure you're using short-lived tokens versus, you know, a token that might be uh, live on forever. You know, in a nutshell, you know, API threats are real, but they can be prevented with the right mindset and price process at your company. And lastly, you know, a lot of abuse, you know, it may look like it's a hacker, but it's not. It's just a, a, a customer that is using your API in the wrong way. Um, maybe it's just due to insecure or, or incorrect documentation. In this case, make sure you keep your developers informed. You know, if they are creating too many reviews, don't just block those requests or, or install rate limits without letting them know that they're hitting those rate limits. Easy way to you know, handle this is trigger emails and let them know, hey, you're running to a rate limit. You know, why don't you uh, hop on a call with support and see how we can best help you. Thanks a lot, and uh, hopefully uh, everyone learned something today about API security. Thanks, Derek. I uh